good evening. Uh, newsletter number 11 is now ready, and as usual, I'll give you details at the end of the program. Last month, I talked mainly about Vega, the brilliant blue star that's been studied with IRAS, the infrared astronomical satellite, and has been found to be associated with material which may very possibly be a planetary system in the process of formation. But this month, I want to take a more general look around the sky, and this is rather a good time to do it, because to all intents and purposes, the moon is out of the way. Planets, I'm afraid, are in rather short supply. Jupiter's disappeared into the evening twilight, more or less. Saturn's gone completely. Mars is still very badly placed. But we do have Venus. And Venus is brilliant now in the morning sky before sunrise. It looks rather like a small lamp, far brighter than anything else in the sky, apart from the sun and the moon. This is a drawing I made of it last Saturday with my 15-inch telescope. And you can see that Venus here appears as a crescent. And that crescent will gradually thicken up until by the second week in October, Venus will appear as a half disk. The actual greatest brilliancy is on October the 1st, when Venus is still a crescent, and the magnitude then is going to be minus 4.3, which is pretty bright. But Venus, in many ways, is an awkward thing to observe. Remember, like all the planets, it has no light of its own. It depends entirely upon what it receives from the sun, and we only see it when part of its light inside is turned towards us. And when Venus is new, that's to say more or less between the sun and the earth, uh, we can't see it at all. The dark side is turned towards us, except on those rare occasions when we have a transit of Venus. Now, the orbit or path of Venus is slightly tilted to ours, so transits don't occur very often. And in fact, they occur in intervals of eight years, and after that, there are no more for over a century. And this is what happens. Venus passes very slowly, directly between the sun and the earth, and it appears as a black spot against a brilliant solar disk, easily visible with the naked eye. And of course, it takes several hours to cross, and not a few seconds, as we've shown here. But the last transit of Venus occurred in 1882, and the next not going to be till the year 2004, so I'm quite certain there's no one now living who remembers the transit of Venus. And they used to be regarded as very important, because for various reasons that I needn't go into now, uh, they did give a very good way of measuring the distance between the Sun and the Earth, the so-called astronomical unit. But that's been completely superseded now, so the next transit of Venus is going to be regarded as interesting, but nothing more than that. Another problem of Venus concerns what we call the ashen light. And that's only visible when Venus is a crescent, and not always then. It's the very faint luminosity of the unsunlit side, the so-called dark side of Venus. Now, we get the same kind of thing with the moon. In fact, you can see it almost any time the moon's a crescent. And that was correctly explained by Leonardo da Vinci as being due to light reflected from the Earth onto the moon. We call it the Earthshine. But you can't have that effect with Venus, because the Earth certainly couldn't do it, and Venus has no moon. And so this ashen light is rather difficult to explain. Uh, some people think it's sheer contrast. I personally don't, because I've seen it too often and too clearly. But uh, in the drawing I made of it, I've certainly exaggerated it, because if I hadn't, I'm afraid you wouldn't have made it out at all. Uh, there were all kinds of theories about it. I particularly like the idea, put forward over a hundred years ago now, by a German astronomer named Franz von Paula Greutheusen. And he suggested that the ashen light was due to vast forest fires lit on the surface of Venus to celebrate the election of a new government, which doesn't seem very probable to me. I think it's much more likely that the ashen light is due to electrical phenomena in Venus's upper atmosphere, uh, possibly similar to our aurorae or polar lights, although since Venus is much closer to the sun than we are, you would expect more brilliant aurorae. And Venus, of course, is always cloud-covered. We can't see the surface at all, even though we do now have information about it from the Russian probes, but uh, that's what makes Venus so bright. It's close to us, it can come within 25 million miles, and uh, the clouds reflect the light very well. So do have a look at Venus. Interesting, too, to see whether anyone can see the crescent shape with the naked eye. I certainly can't, but I've met one or two very keen-sighted people who can. Now, something else in the sky at the moment uh, is Comet Tempel 2. Um, that is, frankly, very faint. The magnitude is 17, which is far beyond um, the telescope in my own observatory. If you want the position, I can give it to you. It's a uh, right ascension, three hours, ten minutes, a declination, minus six. Uh, it's a faint periodical comet. It goes around the sun in a period of five and a third years, and it belongs to Jupiter's comet family. So when it's at aphelion, that's to say, greatest distance from the sun, it's not then very far from the orbit of Jupiter. Now, you may wonder why I'm mentioning it, because certainly no amateur telescope can show it. The reason is that it also has been studied by IRAS, 
the infrared astronomical satellite, which is proving such a tremendous success. And very unexpectedly, they've discovered that Temple's second periodical comet has a long dust tail. And the length is something like 20 million miles. So a very nearly stretched from the orbit of Venus to that of the Earth. And this was totally unsuspected, because we didn't know that periodical comets of that nature had dust tails at all. And in fact, uh, many of them don't. There is another periodical comet of the same kind, visible in the evening sky now, Comet Tempel-1. Our has looked at that and found no tail. So Tempel-2 may be the exception rather than the rule. Of course, you can't actually see the dust tail. It shows up only in the infrared, but it does apparently seem to be there. And uh, of course, efforts will be made to see it visually. Possibly the space telescope is going to help there when it comes along. In fact, you know, comets are very insubstantial things. I think I've heard them described as the nearest approach to nothing that can still be anything. They have a small nucleus, which you don't know much about yet, and a gaseous head, and then, in many cases, the long tail. But uh, they are short-lived, short because every time they come back to perihelion, that's closest point to the sun, a certain amount of their material evaporates, they lose it, they form tails, and so gradually they lose mass. And uh, over the centuries, several periodical comets have been known to dis disintegrate. The classic case was Beeler's Comet. And that used to go around the sun in a period of rather less than seven years. And it was seen at several returns. In 1845, it broke in half. In 1852, it came back again. And there was a drawing by Angelo Secchi, a great Italian astronomer of the period. And Beeler's Comet has never been seen again. And uh, there's no doubt now that it no longer exists as a comet, although we still see uh, showers of meteors appearing from the position where the comet ought to be. Not so many now as we did in recent years, but several meteors from the old comet are still seen every November. And, of course, um, I must mention Halley's Comet, the most famous of them all, 76-year period, now on its way back to the sun. This is the recovery photograph in October last year, and you can see Halley's Comet as a speck in the middle of that circle that's been drawn upon the photograph. It's coming closer in. It's still well beyond the range of what we may call amateur telescopes, and personally, I don't think from my own observatory I'm going to be able to pick it up much before mid-1985. But um, perihelion, closest to the sun, is due in February 1986. And although Halley's Comet's not going to be spectacular, it is going to be very interesting because, of course, several rocket probes are going to be sent right through it. And I'll have a great deal more to say about that later. But enough of comets for now. Let's turn to things that you can see, and that means the starry sky. And obviously, we must start with what I've called the Summer Triangle, made up of three brilliant stars, Vega in Lyra, the half or Lyra, Deneb in Cygnus the Swan, and Altair uh, in Aquila the Eagle. And all those are still very prominent. You can't mistake them, particularly Vega, because it is so bright and it is so obviously blue. In fact, of those three stars, Deneb appears the least bright. It's actually much the most luminous. It's equal to about 60,000 suns put together, and we are seeing it now as it used to be in the days of the Roman occupations, as far away as that. But in Lyra, which is a small constellation, there are two very interesting things apart from Vega. One of these is a multiple star. We call it Epsilon Lyrae, quite close to Vega. And if you look at it closely on a dark night with the naked eye, you'll be able to see that it's made up of two stars making a binary system. Then if you use a telescope, and a good three-inch refractor will do for this, you can see that each member of the pair is again double. So we have a double-double or quadruple system, and they are certainly all connected. There are various other stars in the field, but they are not members of the epsilon Lyrae system. They simply happen to lie in the foreground or the background. But epsilon Lyrae is well worth looking at. And then there's a famous example of what we call a planetary nebula. And this lies halfway between the two prominent stars, Beta and Gamma Lyrae. Gamma's third magnitude. Beta is actually a very interesting eclipsing variable, and I must say more about that another time. But in between the two, we have M57, the best example of a planetary nebula. And when photographed with a large telescope, it really is beautiful. You can see there the actual nebulosity, the ring, uh, and in the middle, you can see the central star, which is responsible for it. The other star is merely a foreground one. I'm bound to admit that you won't get the colours when you look at M57 with a small telescope, or for that matter, a large one. They're too faint for that. But you can easily see the form, uh, looking like a small luminous cycle tower, and uh, if you have adequate power, you can also see the central star. But really, planetary nebula is not a good name, 
because the objects are not planets and they are not really nebulae. What's happened is that a very old star, near the end of its uh, active evolution, has literally thrown off its outer shell. So it's that gaseous ring is now expanding. And uh, in a fairly short time, um, several millions of years, planetary nebulae will cease to shine. Uh, over a hundred are known, but uh, M57 is certainly the easiest to find because it is directly between those two stars. A small telescope's going to show it, and it is well worth looking at. Now, coming back to Cygnus, the swan, uh, often known as the Northern Cross, and certainly it's a good deal more like an X than the Southern Cross is. One member of the cross, Albario, or Beta Cygni, is further away from the centre than the rest and rather fainter, so it does rather spoil the symmetry. You can find it some way uh, away from a line joining Vega to Altair. But when you turn a telescope toward Beta Cygni, all is forgiven. It's a lovely coloured double star with a golden yellow primary and a blue companion. And I always think that's the loveliest double star in the sky. Uh, the separation, the apparent angular separation, is over 35 seconds of arc, so any small telescope will show it, and in fact so will good binoculars. It's a lovely sight. And you know, I just wonder what the spectacle would be to anyone living on a planet in the system of Albario. You'd have a golden yellow bright sun, a smaller blue sun, and the shadow effects would be incredible. Of course, whether there are any planets in that system, I don't know. I rather doubt it, but of course one could be wrong. The Great Bear is still visible. It always is, of course, never sits over here. And almost overhead, we have the W of Cassiopeia, which again is very easy to recognize, and which also never sets over Britain. The leading stars there are of the second magnitude, that's to say, about as bright as the pole star. But near Beta Cassiope, there's one very interesting star which I'd like to draw your attention to. It's called Rho Cassiope. It's not very bright. It's variable, in fact. And I've been watching it for 20 years or so, and it's always remained round about the fifth magnitude, visible with the naked eye, but not very easily. And if you use binoculars, you can check its brilliancy against the two companion stars to either side, a Sigma and Tor. Rho, in general, is about the same as Sigma, a bit brighter than Tor. The interesting thing about Rho Cassiope uh, is that it's um, probably a very luminous supergiant, about 60,000 sun power, that's equal to Deneb, and a very long way away, of course, and no one knows quite what kind of a variable it is. Just occasionally, it drops down well below naked eye visibility and remains at minimum for some time before coming back to maximum. It's not done that since the late 1940s, and so amateur observers keep a very close eye on it to see when it's next likely to start showing any marked changes. I think we may have to wait for a long time, but Rho is always worth watching, simply and merely because it is a mysterious star, and we don't really know exactly what are the causes of its variation. They are certainly intrinsic. Of the autumn constellations, the most famous is, of course, Pegasus, the flying horse. Uh, the four main scars make up a square, and I think most people know the square of Pegasus, although it is perfectly true that many maps and charts make the square appear smaller and brighter than it really is. There are four main stars, Alpha Rats of the second magnitude, Scat, Markab, and Algonib. And if you look at one after the other, you will see that while three of them are white, Scat is decidedly orange in colour. It's um, a semi-regular variable, sometimes a bit brighter than Markab, sometimes a bit fainter, with a rough period of about 38 days, but it is rough. And of course it is a very large star, and the orange colour indicates that the surface temperature is lower than that of the other stars in the square. Incidentally, it's, uh, on a clear night, it's worthwhile having a look at the square of Pegasus and seeing how many faint stars you can count inside it. Try it if it's clear, I think you may have rather a surprise. Leading away from Pegasus is the constellation of Andromeda, the princess of the Perseus legend. In fact, for some reason that I've never have been able to understand, Alpha Rats is actually included in Andromeda. Well, Andromeda itself is made up of a line of fairly bright stars, and at the end one, Gamma Andromedae, or Almark, is another lovely coloured double. And when you look at that through a telescope, you will see um, an orange primary, and again, a blue companion. They are certainly spectacular, they're well worth looking at. They are not so wide or so easy uh, as Albario, but nevertheless they're there and uh, they make a good uh, sight for a small telescope. Once again, we are dealing with a real binary system and in very powerful telescopes, the smaller blue star is a gained double, but you do require quite a lot of magnification for that. But in Andromeda, the most famous object undoubtedly is the Great Spiral, 
Messier 31, so called because it was the 31st object in a famous catalogue of clusters and nebulae drawn up by Charles Messier way back in 1781. You can just about see it with the naked eye if you know where it is. It appears as a blur. And we now know that it is an independent star system, over two million light years away and larger than our own Milky Way system. It contains something like 150,000 million suns. It is a spiral, but it's turned at a rather unfavorable angle to us. And I'm afraid the beauty of the spiral is rather lost. But when photographed with large telescopes, it is a magnificent sight. And it contains objects of all kinds, stars of all varieties, globular clusters, open clusters, gaseous nebulae, everything. But all the same, I am bound to admit that when you look at the great spiral through a small telescope, the effect is, well, frankly, a bit disappointing. This is a photograph taken by Commander Hatfield with his 12-inch telescope. It is a very good photograph indeed, but as you can see, you can't see very much detail there, and that is how you're going to see M31 with a small telescope. Also in the general area is another spiral, Messier 33. This is in the little constellation of the Triangle, and again it's a spiral, uh, not very easy to find. Uh, people say they can see it with the naked eye. I certainly can't. You can track it fairly easily with binoculars, and oddly enough, it's sometimes easier to find with binoculars than a telescope because the surface brightness is so low. But when photographed with large telescopes, it's seen as a rather loose spiral, a little bit further away than M31, and not so large, but still containing a large number of stars. But if you want something really spectacular, go back to Cassiopeia, and use them as a guide to find the sword handle in Perseus. And you can see that with the naked eye, but with telescopes, it's shown up as a pair of clusters in the same field, and that they really do make a magnificent sight. Nothing else quite like them in the sky. Uh, of course, uh, the most famous open cluster of all uh, is that of the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, in Taurus. And that's coming round now. You can see that in the evening sky. Interesting to see how many stars you can count without a telescope. I can manage seven, other people can manage more, and of course the whole cluster contains several hundreds, as is seen when you photograph it with a large telescope. And you can also see a lovely reflection nebula there, which I'm afraid you won't see in ordinary telescopic views. But the Pleiades are there, and um, I always think, you know, that the appearance of the Seven Sisters in the evening sky indicates that summer is definitely over, and autumn is equally definitely on the way. There's one more object I'd like to direct your attention to, Go back to the square of Pegasus and use the two right-hand stars, Scat and Markab, as a pointer. Go down nearly to the horizon and there you will find Fommelhort in the otherwise unremarkable little constellation of the southern fish. And that is the southernmost of the first magnitude stars ever visible from Britain. From North Scotland, you'll be lucky to see it at all. It really is bright. It's about as bright as Deneb. Uh, as you can see, if you see it almost overhead, as you can do from Australia, for example. We don't get the best of it from down here, but this uh, is the best time of the year for seeing it, and I suggest you go and find it. It is, incidentally, one of our nearer stellar neighbours. Well, there's, there's uh, plenty of things to be seen in the sky at the moment, and uh, particularly if you've got binoculars. And frankly, I'd far rather have binoculars than a very small telescope. So do go out and look. And uh, finally, once again, newsletter is ready. And if you want it, send a stamped addressed envelope, please, to newsletter number 11, Sky at Night, BBC Television, London, W12, 8QT. And we will then send you the newsletter. And uh, please don't put any other letters inside your newsletter requests. Those are the ones that are allowable to go astray. Now, our next program, we're going abroad. We're going to take a long, hard look at one of the most famous observatories in the world, Mount Wilson Observatory in California, with its 100-inch telescope. So until then, goodbye and good viewing.